Friends, good evening. Thank you for joining us to our pre-chamber lecture series. Tonight, we will start a two-part lecture that is very specific to the mystical message from the Stone of the Sun. The Stone of the Sun is the Aztec calendar. Back some 10 years ago, uh, by the time that we were approaching December of 2012, many people confused this calendar with, a, with the Maya calendar. Big mistake. Two different cultures, even though their symbols are very consistent, very similar. So we're going to dedicate the next two lectures to speak about the Stone of the Sun. And what we will do is that we will go part by part over the symbols for two main reasons. Reason number one is that this helps expand our cultural foundation in terms of anthropology. And reason number two is that as you come across these symbols in other cultures, as you may come across some of these symbols even in your dreams, Understanding their meaning will help you extract a little bit more wisdom, more knowledge of what you get exposed to that otherwise, well, you would have been oblivious to it. So let's go ahead and start with the Aztec Stone of the Sun. This massive stone is a monolith. That means it is a single piece of rock and it was chiseled right there on the stone. And it is currently at the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico. We find in this great work of Gnosis, four pillars. Here, within all of these symbols, you will see that there is philosophy, mystical practice, there is Magnus art, and there is science. And here in this stone, we see part of the story that we will find otherwise in the book of Genesis, because this is a unique craft that shows four fundamental or four basic cosmogonic principles. Now, cosmogonic speaks about the creation of the world, and we're going to see that this stone speaks about the four previous human races that existed before the Aryan race. So let's start at the very center with Tonatiuh, so that we can see this better. What we will do is that we will overlay the actual image so that you can extract better what it means as we're looking at this stone that has been uh, so consumed by the elements. So this is the image of Tonatiuh. And notice that we see here a man who is blonde that is wearing a crown, an ornament on his nose. On his nose. The mouth is open the tongue is sticking out, and it's got ornaments in his ears and wearing a necklace. Let me show you what these things mean. The crown has three distinct elements. It has at the very center three eagle feathers, and it's got a pearl. That pearl is Ipalnemowani. <laughs> For us here uh, in, in the United States, well, we hear that and we say, well, well that, that, what does that mean? Well, Ipalnemowani is the Hermetic All. The All. In the Hermetic tradition, it has been said, the All is in all things, and all things exist within the All. And he who has understood this has received great wisdom. This all, well, some, some of us may immediately say, oh, yes, I know what you mean. You mean God. <laughs> no, 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 no. This all exists beyond the manifestation of God. Let's put it this way. God emerges from the all. Wow. The all is but unknowable to itself. Nothing can exist out of it. Nothing can come from it because any part that would be extracted from the all would mathematically make it less and that would be completely impossible. So the all is living mind. And that is that pearl right there. And notice that that pearl is resting on three eagle feathers. Those three eagle feathers are three fundamental forces of creation. 
These are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to either side of that, we see that there are two spheres. Those two spheres are known as two Cain. Think of Cain and immediately think about a spine. That soars within our own body that happens to be, based on the words of Apostle Paul, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So two Cain, or dos caña in Spanish, makes a reference to two forces of creation. Because from that all, the Ain, well, there is an unfoldment. And the unfoldment of the Ain as the unmanifested, uncreated light results in a perception that immediately materializes the uncreated space. That is the Ain Sof. So we see here these two spheres as the Ain and the Ain Sof. One of those spheres is Ometekutli. The other sphere is his wife, Omesiwatl. And Ometekutli and Omesiwatl are the Lord and Lady of Duality. When the Ain and the Ain Sof come together, there is a ray of creation that emerges. That ray of creation, well, condenses as God. Generic God as we, as we know it. And that God is Donatio. These feathers are very common throughout the Stone of the Sun, and you will see them appearing in threes all of the time. Now, let's look at his face. You can see that there are wrinkles in his eyes, and the wrinkles are dramatically exaggerated. You can see them as two big C's. And you notice that his hair is golden. Well, these wrinkles indicate that this is the Ancient of Days. It indicates counsel of elders. It indicates mastery, indicates sacrifice. And those two eyes together, beyond, beyond being the eyes of the all-omniscient God, they are also a symbol of infinity. As you look at them, you will notice that they are like a number eight that is resting sideways. His golden hair indicates purity, indicates divinity. And notice what happens in his nose. It is wearing something that is called a yucaxiwitl. This yucaxiwitl is not an adornment. It is not there for aesthetic purposes. It is there because it reminds us that there is a nourishment that comes to us in the air that we breathe. It speaks to us about the science of breathing. And we know <laughs> that science of breathing is so important that it is part of what has been taught for thousands of years in all of the great schools of mysteries. Any sincere practitioner knows about the transmutation of the creative waters, about pranayama, they know about mantras, they know about making use of this life force. And that has been known for so long that finally our modern day science has been catching up with the many different benefits that exist behind mindful breathing. So here we have a symbol that is showing us how important it is to practice this science that enables a transmutation. And notice that there are here six additional eagle feathers. There are three on the left side and three on the right side. Because left and right here, they are showing us that there is duality. Not only duality in terms of the principle of gender, where there is a masculine and a feminine principle, it is also showing that there is duality by virtue of the principle of polarities. That shows that on one extreme we have one thing and on the other, well, it's natural antithesis. But this number six also invites us into looking at rays of light. Six rays that are shining and six rays that are yet to shine. As we see in those rays of light that emanate from the, from the seal of Solomon. 
So this is the Yucac Siwitl. And look at what is happening with his mouth. His tongue is made of flint. It's very sharp. And anthropologists today, well, they would interpret this as if this is the Aztec god that is calling for a blood sacrifice. But this is an incorrect statement. This is not true. The symbol here is indicating that all of creation manifests itself through the power of the creative word. And of course you knew this. But of course it's also telling us that in terms of the use of our creative word, the use of our tongue, we have to be very wise when we use it. Because if we are not wise using the power of our creative word, we will inflict pain. This is why the tongue is so sharp. And we will inflict pain either in ourselves, or we can potentially inflict pain on others. Here, this symbol on the stone is speaking about the same wisdom that is delivered in the Gospel of Apostle John. That is the apostle that gives us the mysteries of air, the mysteries of the creative word. And on his neck, we find that there is a necklace made of jade. This is a chalchiwitl. These are all precious stones. And notice that there are six precious stones. As precious stones, as jewels, this Chalchiwitl is speaking about the virtues of the soul, the powers, the faculties that come from a sacrifice. But there are six that are very specific. And that six is Arcanum number six of the Kabbalah. This number six is indicating for this to materialize, you must define yourself. And that definition is very intimate. That, that definition is, is very occult. It's very private. And when it comes to this work, at some point, as a sincere practitioner, you really have to make up your mind and decide, is this work the map that is dictating where I should be walking? Is this the best guidance that is truly improving the life condition and allowing me to achieve higher levels of being? or not. These are the symbols that we see here in the face of Tonatio. Now look at, his, look at his ears. He is wearing some sort of earmuff. These are ear adornments that also carry those eagle feathers. Now the eagle is a symbol of the Christ. And now seeing these three feathers Every time, symbols of three forces, primary forces of creation, symbols of, of the solar power of the Christ. Well, this is suggesting that when it comes to using our ears, we have to be very selective to the impressions that we are allowing to come into our ears or not. We have to be very watchful to what is it that we give our ear to. Because many times... Uh, we just get distracted and we give our ear as a way for others to open and issue judgments and criticisms and things that really do not contribute favorably to any awakening or development of the consciousness. So this is what the Siunakoshtli are symbolizing to us. Now, as we step back and we start looking at what is beyond this very center of the stone. The beauty about the stone is that as a circle, everything emerges from the center and reaches the periphery. And eventually everything comes back to its very point of origin. This is like a dynamic stone that shows you the flow of creation, the ebb and flow of the creation itself. So as we step back, we can see that to either side of the face of Tonatiu, there are two claws. We have claws that have five feathers each. Now, we already know that the feather, being an eagle feather, 
symbolizes a Christ. And we already know, as we looked at the Chachiwit, that the number six indicates the Arcanum six of the Kabbalah. It is speaking about definition. It is speaking about making the right decisions. But now we see a claw with a number five. And that number five certainly invites you to think about action and consequence. It invites you to consider karma. And those claws are crunching hearts. There is one heart in either claw. As the claws are squeezing those hearts, that speaks about sacrifice. It speaks about voluntary sacrifices that we must undergo. And those sacrifices can be sometimes complex. Sometimes they can be very simple. Because for some of us, making some sacrifices as we are doing self-observation, it could be as simple as not taking an extra bite from a very delicious dessert. Some people suffer tremendously when they cannot have that. But for others, it has to do with the observation and the comprehension of our inferior aspects, of all those things within us that are violent, that are lustful, that are resentful. It also has to do with the sacrifice that comes from having to make certain decisions in life for the benefit of others. It has to do with the sacrifice that comes from stealing away the fire from our own defects so that we refrain on those harmful actions and we are not deliberately, consciously or unconsciously, hurting others. These two claws are present and notice that there is one eye in each one of them. That is because the all-seeing Father is watchful of everything that is taking place in our lives. Now, that does not mean that there is somebody always looking over your shoulder. But what this means is that all of our actions are consequential. That we have to start thinking that not because we're alone, we can just go do and undo as we see fit because we're alone. But rather that everything is truly important. Everything has a very specific consequence. And you can see that there are also three circles. Notice that those three circles are right there in what would appear to be the wrist. These three circles speak of the need of the application of those three primary forces so that we can affect the sacrifice. That sacrifice that has to do with our internal transformation is in reality a sacred office. It is a sacred work. And as at any sacrifice on an altar, well, sacrifices are always done with fire present. That is because fire as a symbol, when we speak in terms of our internal work and transformation, well, that fire is representative of not only superior forces that are available to help us to eliminate our defects, it is also the effect of those emotions that we sometimes have to deal with. So you, as you can see, there are so many symbols and they have so many distinct meanings that just the contemplation and the reflection on these can give you a plethora, a huge treasure of wisdom. Now let's look at the four cos cosmogony areas, eras. Let's remember that cosmogony stands for the four eras. In this case, the four cosmogony eras are the four eras of the creation of the world. And these are very specific to four root races that have already inhabited planet Earth before the arrival of our current root race, which is the Aryan race. We're going to stop, uh, start always at the top right hand corner. And you can see here that we start with Ocelotl Tonatiuh. Ocelotl is Jaguar. Tonatiuh, we know that is God. So this is the son of Jaguar or the divine manifestation of the Jaguar. The Jaguar is always associated to the mind. Let's remember those ancient knights among the Aztecs. Some of them were the knights of the Jaguar. They would be dressed with a garment, a battle gear that would make them look like a Jaguar. And others would be dressed with a battle gear that would make them look like eagles, the knights of eagles. Well, those knights of the Jaguar, 
Those are symbols that show those great masters that developed the mental sagacity necessary to dominate, combat, and defeat the ego. They developed that mental sagacity that allowed them on a psychological plane to prowl under defects and consume them. And we see here the son of Jaguar associated to the very first root race that existed on Earth. That was the polar race. And this polar race, it has been stated, they were devoured by tigers. Well, there were no tigers going around devouring people. But as a symbol, this is very important. Because Samael tells us that on those initial humanities that existed, the earth was going through tremendous transformations. It was semi-ethereal. It was semi-physical. And looking at the polar race, similar as what's carried into the second root race, the Hyperborean race, the rituals in the temples were performed wearing colors of black and white, just to show the conflict between the mind and the dense matter. That transition that those humanities had to endure as the planet itself was coalescing, as the planet itself was crystallizing. So they were devoured by the jaguars, those who were devoured, triumphant, were those who were able to educate, adapt, grow their mind, illuminate it to such a degree that they would continue with their progress. Then we have Ehecatl Tonatiu. Ehecatl is the name of the god of air. And Tonatiu, well, speaks here about God. So we see here the divine power of the wind or movement or the sun of wind. This is associated to the second root race that existed on earth. That root race was the Hyperborean race. And it has been said that they were destroyed by hurricanes. They, they became monkeys. And yes, we must say, nobody here turned into a monkey. But as a symbol, that is so rich. Because we know that monkeys are exceedingly agile to climb trees. And in this case, the reference is to Yggdrasil, the Nordic tree of the Garden of Eden. Here we're speaking about the tree of life. Here we're speaking about the tree of the science of good and evil. These two great trees that existed at the very center of paradise. And they became like monkeys and they spared themselves from the catastrophes and they were triumphant because they effectively learned how to climb those trees. So this is the sun of wind. Then in the third root race, here is where we see the manifestation of the Lemurian race. What we see here is Cuahuitl Tonatiu, and this is the sun of the rain of fire. And it has been said that those in the lands of Mu, the Lemurians, well, they became like birds, and that is how they escaped those catastrophes. And becoming like birds indicates that they were able to achieve a mastery, dominion over the element of air. They were able to soar through the airs of mystery. And air is always associated to the mind as well. So they did not become like birds. But, but however, they were able to achieve a degree of mastery that they could dominate the impulses that were being manifested at the level of the mind. Because let's not forget, it was at the third sub-race of the Lemurian race, exactly as it has been written in the book of Genesis, that we saw those humanities being the ones who consumed of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. We know that all those who ate the fruit, they were expelled from that paradise. They effectively lost all of their faculties, attributes, and virtues, and eventually condensed themselves within the physical plane of creation. After a while, they had no more access to perceiving humanities from other uh, systems in the universe. They were not able to perceive the elementals of nature. They lost the ability to communicate 
and in that desperation, seeking to find their way back into that original condition, the consciousness continued to create aggregates that today exist as our greeds, envies, lust, etc. They became like birds because they were able to soar, dominion over the element of air. And last, we have Atonatiu. Atonatiu is associated to the Atlantean race. Here, what we see is Akatl Tonatiu, the god of the gods, manifesting in the Atlantean race. This son of the rain of water is the manifestation of that universal flood that we see in the book of Genesis as well. At the times of the Atlantean race, well, it's been said that those who spared themselves from the catastrophe, they became as fish. They were able to navigate within the waters of creation. They had dominion over the creative waters, not like all those others who abused of the creative power, those of others who continued abusing of their sexuality to a point in which Nothing in terms of morals pretty much existed. And with that, the universal flood came. And we see then the manifestation of Manu Vaivasvata. That is the biblical Noah with his ark. The ark made of wood as a symbol of the tree of life as well. With four levels. Exactly the same four levels in the tree of life. The realm of the gods, which is Asilut. The realm of creation or the realm of the being, which is Yetzirah. The realm of uh, the elemental magic of nature, which is, uh, ah, the name is escaping me. That is part of the triangle of magic. And then at the very bottom, which is the condensed physical plane, and that is the realm of Asia. So Asia, I remembered, Asia as the realm of substance, Bria as the realm of magic, Jetsira as the realm of creation, and Asilut as the realm of the gods. The same four levels. So notice here that we see that there is an inscription reminding us with Tonatiu at the very center, grinding hearts, telling us there have already been other humanities here. In a deeper message, you have already experienced much of what is happening. You have already gone through many different conditions. You have been rich. You have been poor. You have enjoyed yourselves in your bacchanals and your orgies. You have indulged in the pleasures of the world. And this is everywhere that you have been. And then it tells us where exactly it is that we are. It shows here, Ojin Donatiu. And this piece that looks like a piece of a puzzle, this is the sun of fire and earthquakes. This particular symbol is indicating that the end of this fifth human race is going to be by fire and earthquakes. You have been already through all this. There is a time for sacrifice. There is a time to come back into your origin. Because if we don't do this, what will happen, what will come to be, is a manifestation of fire internally. We know this with all the negative emotions that we experience, with all the violence that we experience today. There will be earthquakes. Yes, that is our lack of emotional stability. That is our lack of a spiritual stability. That is how we crumble before the, the, the tests and the hard circumstances. But also on the outside, in the exterior of man, is indicating there will be changes. And the changes for the race, as has been before, will be cataclysmic. And it is necessary for us to be able to go beyond our current humanoid condition so that we can manifest as men. And Samael uses this word man all the time for the sake of clarification. 
This word man is used as an epicene noun. That means that it is inclusive of men and women. There is no distinction. There is no favoritism. Men and women both have the same rights in terms of their internal development and everything that they can achieve. But somehow uses the word man. Because in its origin, man means the hero. That hero is not just this image that we have created in our minds thanks to Hollywood. No, this hero going beyond into its origin, this is a human that has the faculties and the powers of a god. It is a king of nature. It dominates the elements of air, water, fire, and earth. This is a man that has power over the elements and the elementals of nature, who can work and control tempests as much as can control fire. And that is in the direction where we should be heading ourselves. We have to apply this fire, this internal divine fire that exists within each and every one of us, so that we can take all of those extra creations that after we manifested them, we simply forgot about them and now they have become a burden that we have to eliminate voluntarily so that we can free up the consciousness that is trapped in each one of these many psychological aggregates that we are carrying within. As we do that, we empower ourselves to take that leap from the humanoid condition where today we're not nothing much more than a body, a personality, yes, and, 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 and a soul, but that soul trapped. In that, in, in that combination of those three things, we are not much more than an elemental animal in a human body. And what we're seeking is to allow that consciousness to flourish with the values and the faculties of the innermost. So that we can then take a leap from the human condition into the realm of the true man. Because those are the angels. Beyond that, the archangels, the dominions, the thrones, the powers, the cherub, etc., etc. This is Ojinto Natio. And again, it indicates that the sons of the fifth son, the children of the fifth son, or the children of this Aryan race, will perish by fire and by earthquakes. And then here we have a good representation of the four cardinal points. Again, we start at the top right corner. In sequence, well, we start with the north. And here at the north, you can see that there is a blade of obsidian. This is Mictampa. This is also Teotlampa. Mictlampa is the realm or the region of the dead. And Teo, Teo means God, Teotlampa is the region of the gods. So this northern realm shows us that abode of the gods. It is the realm of the dead, and not because they are just corpses or ghosts, but rather those who were able to truly eliminate all of that that was inferior in them. And they are truly dead in terms of their desires. They are truly dead in terms of lust and anger, of greed and ambition and envies. None of that exists. The next one to the left at the top represents the East. And this is the Tlacopa. The Tlacopa is a region of light. This is on the East where the sun rises. We know that the ancient Egyptians venerated the sun and referred to it as Ra. Amonra, the godson, that thanks to it, everything was nourished and life flourished. We also know that as that remnant from the ancient continent of Mu and the Easter Island, there are these massive monoliths that are all facing towards the east. Symbols of contemplative men awaiting the rise of that Christic cosmic force that is represented by the sun. On the bottom left corner, we see the West. This is Siwatlampa. And Siwatlampa, as the region of the West, this is the place where the women who died at the time of giving birth, that is where their souls go. This is also known as the Tlalocan. 
This is the realm of that goddess, of those of those goddesses who, who perished at the time that they sacrificed their lives to bring life onto earth. And last one is Huitzlampa. But this Huitzlampa, just like in the north, we have Teotlampa, Miklampa. Well, this one at the south is Huitzlampa, the region of sacrifice. And it's also the Xochitlapan. And the Xochitlapan is the region of the flowers. So notice how the south combines sacrifice with flowers. Every sacrifice that we exercise, even something as simple as doing no harm to others, no harm with the way we look at them, no harm with the words we say, no harm with our attitudes, no harm with our judgment, all of these things, whether we verbalize them or we keep them internal, even that sacrifice eventually results in seeds of virtues that flourish. So here, this, this region of the flowers, these flowers, they are all symbols of uh, the virtues, the faculties, powers, bodies, laws of the innermost. Because all of these things together is what make up the soul. Virtues, faculties, powers, laws, etc., etc. All of those things come together, and that is what creates that radiant solar soul garment of the innermost. <laughs> those are the wedding garments that are mentioned in the book of Matthew, in that parable of the great man who celebrates the, the weddings for his son. So here you can see these four cardinal points. Let's go ahead and continue. Notice that as we look at everything that exists within the center, and we have seen Tonatiu, we have seen the four cosmogony eras, we have seen the claws, we have seen the fifth son as the children of the fifth race, and we have already noticed that there are four cardinal points. Notice that there are now two other circles that are emerging from this very center. The first circle shows a week of five days. And then it also shows a month of four weeks. And it also shows a year of 18 months. It should be of no surprise, no surprise at all, that when we put all of this together, we end up with a year of 360 days plus five and one quarter days of service that they dedicated as service, well, not only to the, to the internal manifestation of divinity, but a service to their community, to their lands, to everyone. Going through this, you will see that there are many chiseled symbols around these circles. And so that you can see them better, we're going to move you back and forth, both Aztec doctrine, from the Stone of the Sun to one of the pages of the Borgia Codex. Now, what we see here at the very center, this is the smoking mirror. This black Quetzalcoatl that we're seeing here, this is Texcatlipoca. This Texcatlipoca, the black one, as a smoking mirror, this is the substance upon which creation manifests. If you were to create a, a, a curtain of smoke and reflect, project a picture on it, you would be able to see that in that very ethereal substance that is very unstable and changing, you will be able to see the manifestation of the movie and its perfection. So this is Texcatlipoca. There were four Texcatlipocas, a black one, a yellow one, a red one, and the blue one. But we're not going to get into those details because that is part of another lecture. But so that you can see the symbol of Texcatlipoca here as you, as that internal divinity that is looking to manifest within you. If you see the reflection of Texcatlipoca as that aspect of your consciousness. All of these symbols that we will see are virtues of the innermost that must be present so that we can make 
progress in this vertical path that is life. So let me show you. This is the Tonali. This is the Wheel of Days, and there are 20 days here. This Tonali is the same thing as the Wheel of Samsara. The Tonali is the same thing as the Wheel of Destiny. This is the Wheel of Becoming. This is the Baba Chakra. It is just an Aztec representation. And we read the Tonali, starting at the top and going counterclockwise. So we will start with that alligator right there. This day number one is called Sepakli. Sepakli is alligator. And this alligator is a symbol of the innermost. It exists in a swamp because that is the condition in which we have our consciousness today. It is submerged within the swamp. That is all of our envies and our jealousies and our ambitions and desires. It is submerged right there. So this is a symbol of the innermost, a symbol of the consciousness. But Sepakli is also a symbol of the ego. Treacherous, quiet, patient, waiting to do his tricks. As an ego, Sepakli can devour us. So now that you see Sepakli, now that you see that this is a symbol of the innermost, the consciousness can be a symbol of the ego. When we look at our consciousness, at that internal manifestation that is seeking to develop and flourish, where do we find it? Notice that we find Sepakli under the left foot of Texcalipoca. The right side is seen as the righteous side. The left side as the sinister one, as the dark one. Well, Duality allows us to see it like that so that we can comprehend a little better. And notice that Texcalipoca is stepping on the alligator. As the innermost, well, the innermost following uh, it, its law of fate, where it sets milestones for us to be able to go from one level of being into the next one. Yes, that is a, a, a marvelous condition of support. So here we see Texcalipoca making progress because it stands on the foundation of the innermost. Wow! But it's also telling us we have to defeat the ego. It is also saying the ego deceives. You have to be very careful because it will bite you. Here we find Sepakli. Let's look at the next day. <clears throat> the next day is called Ehekatl. And Ehekatl is the god of movement. It speaks about action, vibration, motion. Huracan is known as the, as the heart of the heavens, and Huracan is, is motion, it is wind. And where do we find Ejecatl? Well, as we see Texcalipoca, notice that from the bottom of his spine, there is a projection that descends. And at the very end of that projection, we find Ejecatl. This is an impulse into motion. Just like we need of the faculty of willpower so that we can exercise self-observation, comprehend the defect, transmute creative waters, invoke of the Divine Mother to eliminate the defect. Well, that requires of an impulse. And here we find the impulse at the very base of his spine. It is saying, seek the true wisdom. It is saying, enough with being distracted with so many schools of kinder that have only served just to give you basic knowledge and since then keep you distracted. No, this is saying, seek the true wisdom. Day number three is Kali. Kali is house. And as a house, if you see a house in your dreams, that is a symbol of the body. That is a symbol of the potential bodies that you could create. So Kali, as a house, represents those superior existential vehicles. The superior existential bodies of the being indicates the condition of the physical body, of your vital body. And when we observe Texcatlipoca, notice where we find the house. The house right there at the foundation of the spine as the foundation of the work. It is here where we find the chakra, Muladhara. 
It is here where we find our Devi Kundalini wrapped three and a half times upon itself. A serpent that must be awakened through sacrifice, dedication, and that impulse that gives Ekatl. So what is this telling us? This is saying, protect your temple. Safeguard your physicality as the temple of the Holy Spirit. On day number four, we find a lizard, Quespalin. And the lizard, as, an, as a symbol of the element of earth, it speaks of balance, harmony, speaks of equanimity. That is the balance and the harmony that must exist in the cylinders of the human machine. Balance, thought, emotion, sentiment, sexuality, instinctive impulses, physical body. Our three brains need to be harmonious. Harmony inside, we can manifest that harmony outside as well. And as we observe Texcatlipoca, notice that the lizard is projecting from his creative organs and is leading the way. This harmony, sexual harmony, this equanimity, making the right use of the sexual creative powers is what leads us into and down and up the path. Day number five, we see Coatl. And Coatl is a serpent. Every time we see Coatl, serpent. Quetza, Coatl. Quetza, Quetzal, speaks of feathers. Coatl means serpent, so the feather serpent. So here we see Coatl. This is the winged serpent of light. This is our divine mother Kundalini. And you can see here that Coatl is projecting directly from his creative organs. This is saying, transmute your waters. But it's also saying, seeing that serpent pointed downwards, if you do not use these creative energies in a way that is favorable, it will project you downward into the inferior realms of creation. Day number six is Mixki. Mixki is death. You can see that it is a skull. And this death, we find it in the she in, in, in not in the shield. We find it embedded in the lances or the arrows of Texcalipoca. Here, the innermost is dressed out with his battle gear. This internal warrior that is our innermost is represented here with battle gear and it carries those spears, those arrows, as a symbol of the sexual libido. And what is saying? We have to use that sexual libido to bring death. But it's not death of others because that would be silly. It is the death of our own inferior aspects. We get rid of the old, and eventually we see the emergence of the new, the manifestation of what is truly pure and divine, that is, the innermost itself. Day number seven is Masatl. And Masatl is a deer. The deer is a symbol of the human soul. We're speaking here about the human soul of the innermost. We're speaking here of beauty. And observing Texcalipoca, notice how this beauty is emerges as a projection from his own head. We see that he is marching towards the right. He is marching in that path of righteousness. And what is guiding him is not only just the balance, the equanimity of the right use of the creative powers. It is also the human soul of the innermost. This is the consciousness moving itself to come back to its source of creation. Day number eight is Tochli. Tochli is a rabbit. And of course, the rabbit with the, the ears that are so exaggerated, it speaks about our ability to perceive and listen. Perceive and listen. Because sometimes we listen beyond the ears of the flesh. Sometimes you have a sense of perception that tells you when something is favorable or not. 
You have a sense of perception that lets you know that there is something else in the environment, something that could be a problem or a suffering or some kind of electricity that lets you know that there is indeed something present. These are many ways of perceiving. And Touchly speaks of listening and perceiving. And notice that Touchly is part of the battle gear of Texcalipoca. We see it here in particular as the crown of the flag of self-sacrifice. Because when we listen to the voice of the innermost, we put aside all of our desires. We put aside all of our material interests. When we listen to the voice of the innermost, it becomes very easy to flow with creation, to see others in need and contributing to their happiness. It becomes easier to observe ourselves and stop our wrongful, ignorant actions simply because we can perceive that that is something that does not truly contribute. Day number nine is Atl. Atl is water. And, well, of course, if we're speaking about water, we're speaking about creative waters. We're speaking about waters that can be transmuted, waters that bring transformation. And speaking of Texcatlipoca, those waters are present at the very crown of his head. They are working there as a mirror. It shows a reflection. In our case, well, our thoughts are a reflection of the quality of our transmutation. Our thoughts are a reflection of the quality of the work that we are doing internally. And thus, we have to become a little bit more aggressive with the way that we self-observe. Then we have Ixkintli. Ixkintli is day number 10. And this is a dog. And a dog is always a symbol of loyalty, of gratitude, instinct, friendship. Looking at Texcalipoca. The dog is at the very tip of the spears, at the very tip of those arrows to be used in battle. The arrows, as a sexual, as a symbol of the sexual libido, well, it's saying this force is your friend. And it is your friend to use it for the death of the ego. That's why we saw Miklan. And it is also what we should do as part of our sacrifice. Then we have also Matli. Also, at least the monkey. This is day number 11. The monkey stands as a symbol of harmony, agility, beauty. Notice when you see Texcalipoca that this monkey is right there, close to the heart. In the tree of life, the sphere of Tiferet is at the heart of man. That is a sphere of beauty. That is the realm of the human soul of our innermost. And in every creation, there must be a manifestation of harmony and beauty. So here we see the monkey near the heart of Texcalipoca. Day number 12 is Malinali. These are grass and herbs that are sprouting in that fertile ground. These are symbol of forces of creation. And looking at Texcatlipoca, those forces are manifesting at the very crown of his head. As forces of creation, they are indicating this ground is fertile. There needs to be tenacity to continue with this tilling of the philosophical earth. There must be tenacity to do the right thing at the right time so that we can harvest at the right moment. And to do this, you are not alone. As symbol of superior powers, this is indicating that there are forces available here, present with us at this moment, that can help us continue making progress. Now, the next time that we come together, we're going into Akatl. Akatl is the cane. But by now, we're starting to run short on time. So the next time we come together next week, we're going to continue here, finish what the 20 days of the Tonali are telling us, and then look at the other symbols that exist within the Aztec Stone of the Sun. So friends, 
for all purposes, this has been our lecture for tonight. This has been part one on the mystical message from the Stone of the Sun. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here with us this evening, and may all beings be happy.